training film designed to instruct the Allied soldier in the recognition of German uniforms, badges of rank and insignia, to acquaint him with enemy weapons likely to be found in the field, and to show him the methods used by a typical German squad against an Allied infantry outpost. No, these are not German soldiers. They may look like it, but they're not. Here you see G.I. Joe doing just another job that the U.S. Army has called upon him to do. But this work is considered vitally important. The groups shown in this film are enlisted men of a mobile intelligence training unit. They have intimate knowledge of our enemy's clothing, equipment, methods, and, yes, his language, for many in these units speak German. They demonstrate this knowledge at army bases in the war zone in the hope that the first time you see an enemy soldier, you won't waste time asking yourself a lot of silly questions. Those of you who expect to take part in close engagements with the Germans will naturally watch this film with interest and try to remember what you see. In the front lines, it will be taken for granted that you know who you're fighting and what he looks like. But others may be in supply, transportation, medical corps, or perhaps in the mess, and may expect never to get a very close look at the enemy. Remember, Uncle Sam has given you a rifle. He has trained you to use it. The enemy we are fighting in Europe today is a master at flanking movements. He often tries infiltration methods and may appear where you don't expect him. So even if you pound a typewriter, a plain nurse may do a peep you may have to grab that rifle and fight like hell. Let's take the group we see here. Under the usual conditions of warfare in wooded areas, these men, let's call them Germans, these Germans might easily be the subjects of observation by an Allied reconnaissance patrol, and Allied headquarters could sift the information obtained. The number of men, branch of service, direction in which they're marching, their regiment, company, and the rank of each man. Supplied with such details, our intelligence could make plans that might result in the elimination of not only this squad, but of the larger unit to which it's attached. First of all, a brief look at the basic uniform, the field gray or gray-green, worn by the greater portion of German ground troops. The helmet with an apron or shelf protecting the nape of the neck, running along the sides to form a sort of visor over the forehead. Painted on the left side is the Army and Navy emblem, the standing eagle grasping a swastika in its claws. On the right side, a shield showing the national colors. Now when he goes into combat, the German frequently removes these little embellishments. He's smart enough to know what nice targets they'd make. This man has cut a neat piece out of somebody's inner tube and has stretched it around the lower part of his helmet. Most of the German infantry use this trick for the same purpose as the netting used by some Allied troops. A few leaves, a little grass, and with the tubing to hold it in place, he has his camouflage. The national emblem, a formal standing eagle with swastika, is worn by all German ground forces. The regular army wears it on the right breast of a field jacket. Ammunition pouches, three worn on each side. This infantryman goes into combat with 60 rounds of 31 caliber ammunition, 10 rounds in each of the six pouches. Running diagonally across his chest is the strap for the gas mask. If you think your gas mask is a headache, you don't know what trouble is until you've tried a long march with this ingenious article. It's a perpetual motion machine. Take a step and it flies up to your shoulder, take another and it bounces down, giving an overall boost of about three feet up the road. Apparently, the old Prussian warlords who have been running the army for years began to have doubts about their own invincibility when they designed this buckle. The inscription, Gott mit uns, means God is with us, and was counted on to bolster the confidence of their soldiers long before the present regime took over. There is one especially characteristic item of clothing worn by all services except flying personnel of the Air Force, the high black boots. Along with the color of the uniform, these black boots should be well remembered as being one of your surest means of identification. So here is the essential German soldier. Helmet, very like the U.S. helmet, except for the extended apron on the sides and in the rear. Also, it has a slightly angular appearance where the U.S. helmet appears more round, more globe-like. 
the standing eagle on the right breast of the field jacket. Six ammunition pouches, three on the right, three on the left. 60 rounds capacity. Strap crossing diagonally to the gas mask. It rests on his left hip. Gott mit uns. Remember the dull silvery buckle. Then the soft black boot coming almost to the knee. One of the best means of identification. Generally speaking, but with a few exceptions which we will take up separately, all ranks of German ground troops in the field will wear the basic gray-green uniform that is shown here. Now in all the armies of the world, whether Russian, British, or Chinese, there is one little man who is very similar. The private. Everything is done for his comfort. He's spoiled by everyone from the general on down. They give him gifts such as clothing, snappy new rifles, shining buttons, and his personal problems are all handled by his noble and understanding friend, the sergeant. Added to all these, the German private is presented with this pip, worn on the left sleeve as a reward for good conduct and attention to duty during his one year of basic training. His pay, however, remains the same. But you can't keep a good man down. Soon after getting the pip, the ordinary private has stepped up a notch and becomes a full-fledged PFC. So one chevron, private first class. Let's say a man were found to possess unusual power to lead his fellows in the field of combat. The lucky man would, of course, become a corporal and proudly bear the distinguishing sign of his rank, two chevrons on the left sleeve. The Germans believe in rapid promotions. After serving as a corporal for six years or more, he not only has his two chevrons, but he gets the pip as well. The group of non-commissioned officers begins with the buck sergeant, not with the corporal as in the United States Army. He no longer wears his chevrons. Instead, a band of white tape is sewn along the top edge of the shoulder strap with a small space left open at the outer end. Also, he wears a white band along the edge of his collar. Beginning with the buck sergeant, we can identify all ranks by looking at the shoulder strap. By the simple trick of sewing a little strip of white tape along the open end of the strap, we create a staff sergeant. Yes, we know what you would all like to give the first sergeant. But let's give him just a silvery pip. One pip, white band along the top, the German equivalent to a first sergeant. The old reliable master sergeant struggles along with two pips. And if you don't think he's been soldiering for a long time, you don't know your German army. Here is a gent who has been an NCO and may someday be an officer. He's the warrant officer and his pips total three. Enemy personnel are strictly ordered to dispose of their shoulder straps in battle areas. This is because of the number, which you have noticed, is generally embroidered on them. That number tells us a man's regiment. On the large button we see his company number. During the early years of the war, it was common for the enemy soldier to carry it in his pocket. It is possible that some may still be careless enough to do this. So if you find one on a prisoner, don't keep it as a souvenir. See that it reaches your intelligence officer. This applies to any article found on enemy personnel. It may only be a scrap of paper, but your duty is to hand it in for interpretation. Something new has been added. A metallic thread sewn on narrow bands running lengthwise on the strap. But no pips. The second lieutenant. This one pip on the plain silver strap shows the rank of first lieutenant. For the highest of the company grade officers, two pips for the captain. Majors, lieutenant colonels, and colonels are field grade officers. And their group brings us to another and more elaborate design an effect of braided bands made of the same silvery metallic thread. The Major here has something in common with the second lieutenant. He has no pips. The lieutenant colonel has one pip, and for the colonel, just two pips. Now let's review. No pips for the private, the second lieutenant, the Major. One pip, first sergeant, first lieutenant, Lieutenant Colonel. Two pips, Master Sergeant, Captain, Colonel. You never know, someday you may capture a German general. 
So just to make sure you would know who he was, here's the shoulder strap of a brigadier. The same device is used to denote rank. One pip, a major general, two for the lieutenant general, and for the full general, three pips. Notice that this strap is surrounded by a dark red border. That simply means general officer. But if you ever see an officer below the rank of general or an enlisted man with a red band around the edge of his shoulder strap, that would indicate artillery. This edging or piping is used to denote branch of service. For example, the infantry men we saw lounging around the bank of a stream. Their branch color, or Waffenfarben, as they call it, is white. The very narrow white edging tells us that the owner of this shoulder strap is in the infantry. Lemon yellow, signals. Wherever there are men wearing this color, you may expect an important command headquarters not far away. Pink for tanks. Very likely you'll see the tanks first. If you do, then it's fairly safe to conclude that the men in them belong to the tank corps and that their colored piping or edging will look like this. Yes, they have a special uniform. And their own insignia, the skull and crossbones. The subject of German tanks brings us naturally to the Panzer Grenadiers, motorized infantry in support of tanks. Their color, grass green. Red is for the artillery. This is easy to remember for the simple reason that in most of the armies of the world, artillery is represented by this color. Thus we come to the last of the six colors used by the six main services of the German army. This black piping is worn by the engineers. The color device, noticeable on every German army uniform, is called Kragenspiegel, and at one time carried the branch color. Now it is simply a decoration, and only rarely is any color included except the silver of the thread from which it's made. It is noticeable among officers that the higher the rank, the richer and more elaborate is the composition of the color device. Talk to veterans of the African and Sicilian invasions. Talk to the paratroopers who led the Allied armies into France. Many of them could tell of instances in which their own weapons were out of service or unavailable, and in order to get themselves out of a tight spot, enemy weapons were found and put to good use. This is a common thing. It has happened many times. So along with the million and one lessons the Allied soldier has to learn, there must be added at least a brief glance at the seven basic infantry weapons of the German. His standard infantry rifle, the familiar Luger pistol carried by officers, his Tommy gun, his potato masher or stick grenade, light and heavy machine guns, and his heavy mortar, the 81 millimeter. If you are familiar with the Springfield 1903 service rifle, as you may be after stripping and cleaning it for 100 inspections, you'll have very little trouble in using this standard infantry carbine 38, the Mauser. In fact, our Springfield has a modified Mauser action. Bolt action, magazine fed, rear sight, a leaf with an open V-notch. Slides on a ramp graduated from 100 to 2,000 meters. There is no adjustment for windage. A special feature is the manner in which the sling is attached to the side of the rifle. On the end of the bolt plug is the safety, operated very much like the Springfield. Cock the piece by sliding the bolt forward and locking it into battery. Move the safety lock left, the rifle can be fired and the bolt worked. Move the lock to the right, and it is on safety with the bolt locked. With the lock upright, it is still on safety but the bolt may be worked. Even in loading, there is a close resemblance to the U.S. rifle. If the German 7.92 millimeter or 31 caliber ammunition is available, open the bolt and press the cartridges down into the magazine. Shove the bolt into battery, safety lock to the left, and you are ready to fire. At ranges up to 1,000 yards, effective and accurate fire can be produced by this light, handy weapon. You may have seen and handled this pistol. It is the familiar Luger. 
very popular in the last war. It is still used to a large extent, generally by senior NCOs, platoon commanders, and company commanders. Caliber 35 or 9 millimeter, eight rounds in a magazine. Weight, a little over two pounds loaded. Effective shooting can be done up to 25 yards. The muzzle velocity is 1,040 feet per second. Holding the pistol in firing position, the safety is on the left side, easily operated with the thumb. Pushed down and to the rear, that exposes the word gesichert, the German way of saying, on safety. Loading and firing, use the same procedure as if handling a Colt 45. Insert a full magazine in the butt and shove home till it clicks. In order to charge the pistol, grasp the two round knobs behind the breech block. Pull up and to the rear. Let go. This operation carries a cartridge from the magazine into the chamber. When the chamber is loaded, the extractor projects above the level of the top surface of the breech block. The word geladen, loaded, is exposed on the left side of the extractor. To eject a cartridge, pull the milled knobs of the toggle joint back as far as they will go, like this. Snap the breech back into place. You are ready to fire. The 9mm Parabellum ammunition for the Luger can be American, British, or German make. The MP40, Schmeisser machine pistol, a cheaply made equivalent to the US Thompson submachine gun. The Germans developed it for their paratroopers after it had stood tests in the Spanish Civil War. By this time, it has been widely distributed among all combat units of the Army. The principle of operation is known as straight blowback. That is, fired from an open bolt, the pressure in the barrel forces the bolt back, empty cartridge is ejected, the spring then forces the bolt forward, chambering and firing a new round. Firing is full automatic only. The safety is a notch marked S in the cut made for the charging handle. Pull the handle back, then push it up into the notch. At best, this is not a reliable safety as a good jolt might easily dislodge it. Sights, two rear sights. One fixed for 100 meters. Directly behind it, a folding leaf set for 200 meters. Designed for both close and medium range combat, it is equipped with a folding stock. Here is the thumb catch. Press it and the skeleton stock folds back and snaps into position. To load and fire, pull the charging handle back and into the safety notch. A loaded magazine is inserted in the feedway, here. It will snap into place. Disengage charging handle from safety notch. You are ready to fire. Notice that the magazine can serve as a grip for steadier operation. The ammunition is standard 9mm or 35 caliber parabellum, which incidentally is used in all German pistols and submachine guns. The potato masher is the grenade that you will find in general use among the Germans. The head consists of a thin iron casing filled with explosive. It is screwed on the wooden handle, through the center of which runs a double length of cord. One end of the cord is attached to a lead ball, which is part of the friction igniter system. At the other end is a porcelain ball, which is exposed by unscrewing the metal cap on the lower end of the handle. Delay fuses are set to four or five seconds. The friction igniter detonator system is charged by putting the detonator into the open end of the delay fuse. The head and handle are then screwed together. When the grenade is armed and you are ready to throw, this porcelain ball is pulled out as far as it will go. In attempting to put these grenades to use, watch out for the common German trick of using them as booby traps. They do this by removing the delay fuse. So make a test of one or even several that you may find. Install it at a safe distance, and remember, its blast is dangerous within 14 yards. Attach a cord to the porcelain ball and pull. If there is a four or five second delay, you know that they are safe for use. The first of the two machine guns to be reviewed in this film is the MG-34. MG stands for Machinegewehr, or machine gun. 
All types of German units are equipped with this flexible all-purpose gun, which is not directly comparable to any U.S. or British weapon. Seen here is the bipod mount, but it can also be used as a heavy machine gun on a special tripod with elaborate sights or on an anti-aircraft mount. Ammunition, 7.92 millimeter or 31 caliber, same as that used in the infantry carbine 38. Cyclic rate of fire is from 800 to 900 rounds per minute. This belt holds 50 rounds and may be connected with another or in a series of several. Made of non-disintegrating metallic links, refilled many times, the belt feed is still only one of several feed systems with adapters found in use with this gun. Standard sight for use with a bipod mount is the vertical leaf sight with open V-notch. Graduations are from 219 to 2,187 yards. Safety. The small lever on the left side just over the trigger. Remember that when the F is exposed, the gun is in a position to fire. When the S is visible, it means that the weapon is on safety. F for fire, S for safety. Even with the feed cover down, this gun can be loaded conveniently. But in order to better examine the feed system, let us load with the cover raised. We push forward on the cover latch, here on the rear of the cover plate. We see that this gun is left-hand feed. You may also find them with right-hand feed. Allowing two empty links as tabs with which to hold the belt in place, set the first cartridge against the left side of the cartridge holding poles. Close the cover securely. Cock the gun by drawing back on the charging handle, back as far as it will go. Now always remember to return the charging handle to its forward position. Unless this is done, you are in danger of injury to the hands and wrists when the bolt drives forward to engage the first cartridge. Check the safety lever to see if you're ready to fire. The F for fire is revealed. The gun is ready for use. Here is the double trigger. Top triggers for single shot, sometimes used to simulate a lone rifle. The lower position is for full automatic fire. After firing from 250 to 300 rounds, a new barrel is installed by a very simple device. The gun is cocked, set on safety. The receiver catch on the left, just below the rear sights, is freed. And the receiver is given a sharp turn counterclockwise. Now the hot barrel will slide out and a new one can replace it. Though ingenious in design and normally efficient in operation, the German machine guns are not foolproof. They are subject to all the malfunctions usually met with in automatic weapons of any nation. Some experience in overcoming failure to fire or stoppages of various origins, plus a natural curiosity in the mechanical field, should reveal in a short time the most common weaknesses of the German weapons. Over 1,000 rounds per minute. That's a very high cyclic rate of fire. But in this late model machine gun, the 42, the German army have sacrificed a certain amount of accuracy. Intelligence reports have for some time indicated the gradual replacement of the MG 34 by the 42. This has since been confirmed. The later weapon is characterized by the pressed steel jacket, extensive use of stamped and pressed metal give the receiver and barrel jacket a more rectangular appearance. The sight is different from the 34. It slides on a ramp. The charging handle is larger and grooved to fit the hand. The device for replacing the barrel has been changed. Note the handle on the right side and the improved method of effecting this operation. The special trigger for single shot or semi-automatic fire is absent in the 42. Lastly, a bolt action which has been designed to give a higher rate of fire. Here's a German weapon that should give a good account of itself in Allied hands. It is so similar to the U.S. Army 81mm mortar that anyone familiar with that weapon could, after a little practice, put the German weapon to effective use. A muzzle loader with firing pin at the breech end of the tube, it weighs 125 pounds, throws a seven and three quarter pound shell effectively at from 425 to 1300 yards. 
For a short period, a firing rate of six rounds in eight or nine seconds can be maintained. For handling and transporting, it is broken down into three parts. Base plate, the tube, and the bipod with transversing, elevating, and cross-leveling mechanisms. Preparing the mortar for action. Set the base plate on the ground. Set the ball-shaped end of the tube into the base plate socket, flat section to the side. Turn the tube in the socket until the spring-actuated bolt is on top. The bipod now goes into position. See that the bipod legs are parallel to the line of the forward edge of the base plate. Now open the mortar barrel clamp. Set the elevation so that one third of the elevating screw shows above its tube and place the barrel inside the clamp between the two position marks. The sight fits on this base. It will generally be a part of captured mortar equipment. Here is the seven and three quarter pound shell, model 34, a conventional type of the percussion fuse. There are four charges, giving muzzle velocities of 246, 344, 427, and 499 feet per second. One added precaution should be given. When the shell is dropped into the barrel, all members of the crew should lie flat on the ground. Set in the ball-shaped section of the breech is the safety. When a misfire occurs, press the bolt in and turn in a clockwise direction until the letter S is reached. Loosen the tube clamp, rotate the tube 90 degrees, then tighten the tube clamp. Now gently raise the tube and let the shell slide out into the hand. Instructions for determining the direction of fire, elevation, and making corrections for the 81 millimeter heavy mortar are contained in U.S. Army publications. A few moments spent in studying these instructions might someday repay you a thousandfold. These weapons have been presented as being the ones most likely to be found and put into operation. Now you will hear some of them actually firing. Hearing the report of these guns will probably give you your first clue to their location in the field. So your part in this film is to look, to listen, and try to remember. An example of the German enemy operating in the field, points in which his methods differ from our own, and above all, the principle of self-sufficiency of his small units are shown in the sequence that follows. This field, surrounded by dense woods, is covered by an allied light machine gun team whose job it is to delay the advance of a German infantry platoon, one unit of which, called a grouper, occupies a point in the distant woods. You will have a close view of the German. Watch for the points that may help you to spot him under combat conditions. Learn some of his tricks. You may be able to put him out of action before he can accomplish them. The Allied position. An improvised, lightly defended outpost. In fact, the top portion of an abandoned armored car. A good field of fire is commanded here, for as you will see, all the cunning and firepower at the command of 10 enemy infantrymen will be required to storm and capture the strong point. A common sight in the German army, the sergeant as leader. He is very often a veteran of hard campaigns, perhaps even a military tactician in small-scale operations. Here you see him briefing his squad. He has drawn sketches, surveyed the terrain over which they must advance, and he has carefully planned each move. Now he passes on his instructions to the nine men who look to him as leader. Making up his assault team are six rifles.